I'll look it. Part 1. You will hear two people organizing a going away party for a mutual friend. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hey Bruce, looks like we got some planning to do for Albert's going away party, right? There are certainly some things we have to talk about now. Yeah, that's better than doing everything at the last minute. OK, so I can write some notes as we talk. Sure thing. So, when should we have the party? Hmm. He goes to Thailand on the 26th of August. OK. Let's have it on the 24th then. Yes. Let me see. That's a Friday. That'd be perfect. Now, where should we have it? At a bar or a club? You know, I think he would like something really intimate, nothing too loud. A restaurant would be good. Maybe the Apple Tree Grill? Great place. Sounds good. OK. Now we have to think about who to invite. Well, his best friend from college. Sure. And his cousins? Right. Oh, yes, his co-workers. Yeah, OK, his co-workers and his boss. Any other people? How about his yoga classmates? Hmm, he does love yoga, but that might be too many people. I suppose so. I can email and text message the invitations. When should I send them? We should send them out soon, but not too early. How about the 16th of August, then? Well, why not give it a few more days? The 13th? All right, I think that's a good time, too. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. OK, now. We have to think of a gift. Should we all get one? No, I was thinking we could all give money for the party and the gift. You know, something really nice. Yeah, that'd be better than getting him little things individually. I can ask for the money. Thanks for doing that. How much should we ask for? I think we should ask for maybe $15 each. Is that too much? No, not at all. He's going away for two years. That would give us about $150. That's a good amount. Yeah, well, I'm thinking we could get him something practical. Yes, especially since he's going abroad. Something he could use, something that's also portable. We could get him an article of clothing, perhaps, or maybe even a pair of shoes. Hmm, shoes are nice, but they might wear out easily, especially where he's going. Maybe a book light? A what? Yeah, he loves to read, and a book light would be very convenient when he travels. OK, that's one good gift idea. Did you write that down? Yep. Now, we need to think about reservations at the restaurant. Well, we should get their big banquet room, yeah? Yes, definitely. Should we ask the restaurant to prepare a buffet? Isn't that expensive? No, I don't think it is. A buffet dinner sounds cheaper than everyone ordering individual meals. Definitely. How about drinks? They can buy drinks themselves or bring their own. OK. Yeah, it would cost too much if we bought drinks ourselves. Certainly. We have to ask someone to bring an MP3 player. The restaurant has speakers and we can hook it up for music. Sounds good. Actually, there is one more thing that I thought we should do since Albert is leaving for such a long time. 
What were you thinking of? Maybe we could have a slideshow of all the fun times we've had. Hmm, that'll take a little bit of work, but I think it's a great idea. Actually, in the invitation, can you ask for some photos people have of him? Yeah, definitely. I can scan them, or people can send me digital photos they have. All right. I'll tell them when I send out the invitations. Then I can make a little presentation. Ha! <laughs> I can't wait to see his reaction. Yeah, especially that one picture where. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Now it turns to part two. You are going to hear a guide named Matt who is introducing their trip in Wildlife Haven. Now you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen to the first part of the introduction carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Matt, and I'm one of the three guides here at Wildlife Haven. Our job is to make sure that you all have a great time here with us and go home feeling happy and relaxed. As you can see, we're away from the city in a remote area between a national park and the sea. To encourage you to relax, there are no radios or TVs, and the only phones and newspapers are in the office. So, if peace and quiet is what you've come for, this is the place to be. From your cabin on the hill, you'll find you have the national park behind you, and you can look out from the sea from your front balcony. Your luggage will be unloaded from the bus and taken to your rooms in a few minutes. Once you have picked up your key at reception, please locate your room and check that all your luggage has arrived. The daily program here at Wildlife Haven is flexible and only as demanding as you want it to be. You should each have a brochure setting out the facilities and various walking tracks you can take. And on the bus, you are given a green sheet setting out a number of group tours in the coming week. If you want to join any tour, just write your name and room number on the relevant sheet along the wall here. Tomorrow, there is a Beachcombers and Rockhoppers tour exploring marine life in the rock pools along the beach. Or, if you'd prefer to go inland, there's a guided forest walk that takes you off the walking tracks. If you want to catch some lunch, you could join the beach fishing expedition. And at night, you'll see there is a moonlight forest walk that leaves each night at 7 p.m. So there is plenty to choose from at Wildlife Haven, and of course, that includes just sitting on your balcony watching the waves roll in but I would recommend my favorite tour, the Waterfall Walk. This departs at sundown each day and also provides the opportunity to have a moonlight swim. Now you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. In the second part of the introduction, you are going to get some advice from Matt. Listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. You've chosen to visit us in January, which is one of our hotter months. And although you may be tempted to wear a minimum of clothing, you should always take precautions against injury, particularly in the National Park. This includes sensible footwear. You'd be surprised how many of our guests ignore this advice and end up being sorry. And socks are a good idea too. And even though you might be under trees a lot of the time, 
It's a good idea to wear a hat in this hot climate. There's no need to be too concerned about walking in the national park, provided you use common sense. It's true that there are poisonous spiders in the park, but they are really more frightened of you than you are likely to be of them. I should also warn you against eating any wild berries. Some are edible, but you should avoid them all. We'll provide all the food you can eat. Well, that's about all for now. Dinner is from 6 to 8 p.m. in this building. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear two friends discussing a course they have just done. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Oh, Ben, I just remembered I never filled in that form for Nick. Ah. Did you do it? The course feedback form? Yes. If you want, we can do it together. I've got mine here. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Let's have a look then. What do we have to do? Let's fill in the top first. Let's see. Course. Course code. Uh, it's communication in business. Okay. Communication in business. I do know that, but what's the code? CB16 something. CB162, isn't it? Mm, that's it. Okay. And dates. When did we start? I remember my birthday's on May 4th, and it was the day after... It must have been May 5th. Gosh, it doesn't seem that long ago, does it? No. And we finish at the end of this week on Friday, so that's uh, July 15th. Uh, 16th. Oh. Mon Monday was the 12th. Yeah. Right, that was the easy bit. <laughs> now, let's have a look. Mm. Please mm. give your comments on the following aspects of the course. Okay, what's the first one? Oh, course organisation. Mm. What do you think? Uh, clear. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, I think the organisation was clear. Hmm. OK, anything else for course organisation? Um, it was a good thing he gave us the course outline at the beginning, in the first session. That was useful, so I'll put that down, shall I? Yeah. Now, going on to suggestions for improvement, one thing that wasn't so good, I think we could have done a bit more work at the beginning. I mean, at the beginning, it seemed dead easy. Yeah. I thought it was going to be really easy, and then all of a sudden in the second half of the course, we got a whole load of work, yeah. reading to do and essays and things. Yeah, it'd be better if it was more even. Mm. Okay, now course delivery. Does that mean teaching? Yeah, I suppose so. Well, what I thought was really good on this course was the standard of teaching. Actually, I mean, some of the teachers were better than others, yeah. but the standard generally was fine. Much better than other courses I've been on. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Let's put that then. Okay. What about suggestions for improvement? I... I didn't think it was all that wonderful when we had great long group discussion sessions that went on for hours and hours. <laughs> right. I don't mean we shouldn't have group discussions, just that they shouldn't go on too long. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Now on to materials and equipment. Oh, now what was good about some sessions was the handouts. Yes, I thought all the handouts were good, actually, and some were great with website addresses and everything. Mm. One problem, though, with materials was the key texts. Yes, there just weren't enough copies on reserve in the library. And if you can't get the key texts before the session, how are you supposed to do the reading? Yeah. And not enough computers. You have to wait ages to get one. OK, testing and evaluation. Well, I don't know. It's hard to say until we've got our written assignments back. Oh, don't talk about it. I only got mine in yesterday. It was a real struggle. Oh, I hate to think what mark I'll get. Yeah, but at least we've done the oral presentation. Hmm. I thought that was good, the way I got my feedback really quickly. Yes, it was. And I liked the way we knew what would be evaluated on. We knew the criteria, so we knew we had to think about clarity, organization, and so on. Yeah, but I'm not so sure about the written work. Mm. One thing, I think, is that there's just too much. It's really stressful. Oh, yes, I'd agree. And I don't see why they can't let us know the criteria they use for marking. The written assignments, but he told us. No, for the final exams. Oh. What are they looking for? What are the criteria? What makes a pass or a fail? Yeah, I never thought of that. It would be really useful. Mm. OK, any other comments? I thought student support was excellent. Yeah, me too. OK, excellent. Other comments? No, I can't think of anything else. Mm, nor me. OK. So that's done. Thanks, Ben. No, thank you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on a psychological condition called synesthesia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Today we're going to look at a fascinating condition that challenges the idea that we all see and experience the world around us in a similar way. For example, what do you see when I mention a day of the week or a month? What colour is the letter A or the number 10? If you often find yourself having more than the normal sense sensations, you too could have a condition known as synesthesia. Synesthesia is a harmless but fascinating condition which is often described by psychologists as the joining of the senses. We normally experience our senses individually, so we see a colour or hear a word, whereas people with synesthesia will find two or more senses being stimulated at the same time by a single stimulus. Some people will see or feel a colour when they hear a sound. 
Others will experience a taste or smell when another sense is stimulated. This happens automatically. The sensation can't be managed. People often go through life unaware that they have the condition. A common response from individuals who learn for the first time that they have synesthesia is one of surprise to discover that other people don't experience the same thing. It's a normal part of life for them, and they will rarely describe the symptoms negatively. To estimate the numbers of people with synesthesia, one group of researchers sat people in front of a computer and showed them letters and numbers in black. Participants were asked to choose a colour for each character they saw. A small proportion of participants, namely those with synesthesia, consistently described the same characters as having the same colours. On the basis of the results, researchers were able to predict that synesthesia affects about 1% of the population. This number has been confirmed in other research. Synesthesia takes many different forms, but the most common is to see or feel a colour in relation to letters and numbers. It's commonplace for people to identify A with red, B with blue and so on. Some people will actually see a colour, but in most cases it's a question of feeling or sensing the colour. However, it's just as commonplace to see days, months, letters and numbers spatially, that is in lines or circles, for example. People might say they see Monday up high, Tuesday just below Monday, Wednesday on the left, Thursday on the right and so on. This doesn't mean that people with synesthesia always agree on what they sense. Two synesthetes will often argue over the colour of a letter, for example. But patterns emerge if a large enough sample of people are observed, providing clear evidence of this condition despite individual variations. Colour and spatial synesthesia are amongst the most common forms of the condition, but they are by no means the only way people experience it. One of the more interesting combinations is word-taste synesthesia. This occurs when words lead the person to experience tastes or certain taste sensations, so a person's name might have the flavour of a particular sweet. Places might be associated with the taste of particular snacks. Taste needs to be seen in a wider context here. The sensation may be a feeling on the tip of the tongue or at the back of the throat and will differ from person to person. Some researchers believe we are all born with the condition and that it's most prevalent in our early years, but it then tends to become less noticeable as we enter childhood. It's a fascinating thought that as infants we experience the world around us through our senses in a different way than as adults. However, testing this hypothesis will be challenging, bearing in mind the difficulty of getting feedback from young infants. Research also points to the fact that synesthesia runs in families. In fact, as many as 40% of synesthetes, as they are called, know of someone in the family with a similar condition. This won't necessarily be a close family member, and the condition may be traceable back to previous generations or to an extended family member such as a cousin or uncle. There is evidence that synesthetes are often creative and will often have artistic hobbies or interests. Researchers think this is not necessarily because synesthesia makes them naturally more talented in this area, but the fact that they have multiple sensory experiences generates an interest in, for example, art or music. So, that's synesthesia. Apart from its intrinsic interest, for psychologists it's a fascinating indication that we may all experience the world around us in different ways. Once upon a time, these findings would have been regarded as highly subjective, lacking evidence, and not of any scientific worth. However, we now have a much greater interest in how the brain helps us make sense of the world, and the study of synesthesia is one way for us to discover more about this. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.